Welcome to New Hope Community Church. If you're a guest with us this morning, then will you honor us with your presence? Thank you for being here. Uh, we would love it if you'd fill out a Connect card that's in the pew in front of you um, so that we can send you some information in the mail about what happens around here, not just Sunday mornings, but throughout the rest of the week because it's pretty busy almost every day here at church on campus. Um, also, if you have prayer requests, if you're a regular attender and you have prayer requests uh, or you want to change information, you also can use the Connect card. That's a way of communicating with our office that there's information that you need to pass on to us or to pass on to the office staff. Um, we do pray every Tuesday morning as a staff. We get together and have a staff meeting. We pray about all your needs, everything that's filled out in the Connect cards, any, any other stuff that we hear about or know about, uh, we go in prayer specifically for those needs. So please feel free to do that. Um, Today is a special day. Once a year, this rolls around. So, no, no, not that. No. No. Today is the, the first day of cookie selling season for the Girl Scouts. So, this is a picture of my house. Yeah, my wife runs one of the biggest troops in the area, so we picked up 9,800 boxes of cookies yesterday. And. Some of them got picked up, but these are just somehow. So for six weeks every year, my house turns into a cookie warehouse. I just hope we don't get rodents this year, because they will have a field day in there. So. so the question is, those of you that are on the Daniel plan, which cookie is the most healthy cookie out of the Girl Scout cookies? Well, none of them is the answer, but the ones that are better than none, the shortbread, and the peanut butter sandwich are the two that sort of, the shortbread has the least amount of calories, the peanut butter sandwich has the least amount of saturated fat. So you can weigh up what, it, what you want to do with that. But technically they're all cookies, they're all full of bad stuff, and, but they taste good. Especially s'mores, s'mores are the best, I think, but that's just. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was a damaged case. We had to take care of it. <laughs> so, what can I tell you? Um, okay, announcements. <laughs> Get back on track here. Okay, so prayer breakfast. The prayer breakfast we have... Now, we only have three tables that are full now, so if you have opted for a place at the prayer breakfast, $25, if you could take care of that with the office, we'd appreciate it. That's February 19th. If you need information about when it starts and all that kind of stuff, their website has a lot of information, but also you can just call the office and find out if you'd like to know what time and everything that begins. Um, there's clipboards today. There's two things on the clipboard. One is the high school um, Mexico mission trip. Every year the high schoolers go to Mexico during spring break. If you would like to support them, what they would like to do is have you sign up and they will send letters out for asking for support. And we do it this way right now because they used to just send letters to a whole bunch of people that they knew. So some people in the church would get like 10 letters and then they couldn't choose between one over another and they didn't, so they ended up doing nothing and so, because they didn't want to play favorites. So what we're going to, what we're doing this year is that you can sign up if you would like to get a letter to help support the kids going to Mexico. Uh, and they do great work down there. So that would be an awesome thing. Uh, there's also on here is sign up for senior lunch. So senior lunch is on here as well. So if you'd like to come to senior lunch, that is on the February 12th, Tuesday, February the 12th. It costs $5. It's not a potluck this time, so it's just bring $5 and there's a catered lunch. I know some of you prefer that anyway. No pressure to bring food. Just $5 is much easier. So anyway, that's senior lunch. And, and that, again, will be sort of associated with the youth. It'll be an opportunity for you to connect with the youth so that you can mentor and pass on your huge years of wisdom to the youth department, uh, which I think is critical, and we should be doing this as an older generation in a church, connecting with the younger generation in the church to provide spiritual mentorship, life mentorship, anything like that, that really, really helps out um, a lot for the younger people to understand uh, what your story is and how you got there and your spiritual walk. Uh, I think it's, it's a really great thing to connect. Um, the book club, there was going to be information about the book club on the website uh, this week, but it'll be on next week and Facebook, and there'll probably be an email from Fawn. So if you signed up for the women's book clubs, they start on the week of February 25th. So that's the week they start, and how you can figure out where you're going and everything will be communicated to you over the next week. 
Uh, this coming Saturday is Men's Breakfast. That is sponsored by the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. They are sponsoring the whole breakfast, providing food, the whole shooting match, so we didn't even have to cook it. We just turn up and enjoy it. So um, I have no idea what we're eating. I'm, I can't promise it's going to be Daniel Plan approved. I'm sorry, because <laughs> we were going to try and make an option for that. But uh, anyway, we'll see what they offer us. But that'll be an opportunity to have a short presentation from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, talk about what they do, talk about their sponsorship of Hume Lake uh, camps for some kids and how they raise money for that. Uh, I think there's a clay pigeon competition coming up, so they'll be asking us to put teams together for that. Um, so that should be a great breakfast. That's this coming Saturday, 8 o'clock. Coffee's ready at 7.30, so turn up and uh, have great fellowship and food. Uh, I've done the senior luncheon. We need used bicycles or bicycle parts. Used bicycles, they can be in any, any shape. doesn't really matter. Just bring them in, and we'll take them. And prison fellowship need them. They take them to Valley State Prison, and they sort of use parts, or they re refurbish these bikes, uh, and they get used. So please bring them in at the weekend of uh, Sunday, February 17th. Uh, Fred Mendrin, if you have questions, he'd be our co contact for that. Or you can call the office if you have any specific questions about that. Uh, also, Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery has been at New Hope now for 10 years. Yeah. 10 years, which is awesome. It was one of the few Celebrate Recoveries in the Clovis area when it started, so, and now there's, there's many more, but this, is, this has been going for 10 years here at New Hope under the leadership of Eric Olson. So uh, we want to celebrate that, and that's coming up on the 21st of February, uh, and that'll be a meal at 5.30. It'll be barbecued by the men's ministry, and then there'll be um, a worship service. There'll be testimonies and prayer and everything, so it'll be, it'll be a great time. Everybody is welcome to come. In fact, we'd encourage you to come to show your support for this great ministry that has done so many wonderful things for so many people in this church and for people outside of this church. It's a, it's a really good outreach as well. Uh, so come along to that and there will be cake. So, <laughs> cake's always popular, I don't know. No cookies. Huh? No cookies. Well, it might be. Um, <laughs> Um, also, I would draw your attention to, you know, my fun facts have been bumped, got fired by the publisher, and now, <laughs> now Fawn has her list of movies on here. So if you'd like to, if you want some information about uh, faith movies, uh, we encourage you to go watch faith movies, because the more people that go watch them in the theaters, the more they will make, and they'll become much more mainstream, and that's, that's a great thing for the movie industry, it's a great thing for the general public, so we encourage you to, uh, to support faith-based movies. Um, throughout that. Uh, the 1040 team. So Tim uh, obviously is not here. He's gone to Africa. He's just, they landed in Ivory Coast about 30 minutes ago. So they're probably dealing with the chaos that is immigration and customs at, uh, in the Ivory Coast right now, which is not the funnest part of the trip, I can tell you. Um, so they're, right, they're there right now, the four of them that are from our church. So we just uh, ask that over the next two weeks, keep them in your prayers. Pray deeply for them because this is not an easy trip. It's, uh, it's hard work. It's you know, just a lot, of, um, a lot of things that need to be done by this team. And 1040 do a wonderful job of doing so many things in the short period of time that they have to do it. And uh, everybody in the team is a critical part of making that work. So just keep them in your prayers over the next two weeks. Uh, the focus that most of them will have from our church is the Kids Fest, which is like VBS um, for African kids in the village, which is great. And they are very, very so attentive. When you teach them all the Bible stories, they just love it. They love, you know, having the, the songs that they learn. They love the snacks that you give them because <laughs> actually we had... No, I'm not going to go there, but... <laughs> too political, not going there. Um, <laughs> So we have, yeah, they have snacks, they play games, they do a lot of fun stuff, and they, it's really um, a great time for the kids. And they just look forward every year for everyone to come back and do it again. And they get to learn about the gospel of Christ, and that's the most important thing, uh, because that is a foundation for everything else in life that they need. And obviously the medical side, construction side is huge. Um, they, they build a lot of buildings over the, the period of time they've been going. They do a lot of medical procedures that are critical and life-saving to so many people there. So we, we're just thankful that we can be a part of that every single year, and that we have a team that goes every single year, led by Pastor Tim. Uh, also, we have kids up at Heartland right now. There's 17 kids up at Heartland, mostly girls. There's only three boys, and I think the rest of them are girls. Um, so heavily outnumbered up there. Um, I don't know what that says, but it doesn't, doesn't maybe it said nothing. The boys are having fun, right? Yeah. 
Well, sixth grade, and fifth, sixth grade. <laughs> But they, they have had a lot of rain up there. They've had torrential rain up there for 24 hours. So they did not get any snow, which is what they really wanted, but they just had an awful lot of water to deal with. So just pray for them as they come back down the mountain. We have a group of parents that are going up to pick them up shortly. So um, in fact, they're leaving pretty quickly. Um, that's why my wife isn't here, in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> She's going up there. I know Tim said, everybody has to come to church today. And congratulations, you made it to church today. <laughs> I felt bad the amount of pressure he was putting on everybody, but <laughs> I, I do appreciate who turned up today. So. Um, I think that is all the announcements. We have prayer requests. Um, Kenny Ross, who's Judy's, Judy Woodley's nephew, uh, is in really critical condition in hospital. Uh, he was working on a motorhome. It fell on him, so he's, he's really in bad shape. Uh, it's difficult getting information uh, from them because they're not in the area, but... Uh, so just keep Kenny Ross in, in, your, in your prayers as you go through your daily prayer list. But uh, Irma is back in hospital. Tim's here, but uh, Irma's back in hospital. They're trying to figure out what's going on with her. Um, they did a spinal tap. They're doing tests. I'll know more information today. Um, Irma's been fighting cancer for some time. Uh, so this is a real setback. So we'll just, um, we'll just keep her in our prayers and make sure that uh, we see her soon and that she will get, um, she will get well very quickly. Um, Dan Sullivan is also here. He's been fighting cancer as well. So we just uh, ask you to keep him in prayers. Uh, he's looking great. So, you know, we are, you know, and it's so exciting to see you here. And um, so we just pray for this season of life right now. And that, you know, and the same thing for Jenny Stages, someone else from our church, a young mom who's going through another round of cancer. So we just keep all of them in our prayers at this time. The Hicks family, the Hutt family, the Duchesne family, all associated with New Hope, um, had funerals over the last couple of weeks, and they're still obviously working through the loss of a loved one. That's always tough. So please pray for them as, as you pray. And also the 1040 team and um, all, that, all the work that they're doing. So uh, I'll ask our ushers to come forward, and then we will pray. Yep. Oh, there's one extra. Sorry. So I'm holding it. I didn't even see it. Uh, Vivica and Joey. So this is from the Downs uh, family. Um, it's Michelle and Mark's son and girlfriend. They had a head-on collision um, in very bad... Well, she's, she's in very bad shape. So please pray for her and pray for recovery, pray for strength um, as they deal with this particular this particular time of life. So very, very difficult. Um, anyway, so if the ushers can come forward for our morning tithes and offerings, and then we will pray and then get back into worship. Lord God, we are just thankful for this, this season. The, even though, you know, there's so much rain to deal with up in the mountains, we're just thankful for the rain because you know that we need it so badly. So Lord, we just thank you for that. And, um, we just pray today specifically for this 1040 I team as they uh, arrive in Africa, as everything is set up for them by the advance team. We pray for, for Tim and our team as, as they represent new hope, as your hands and feet in the African soil. And Lord, we just pray for strength for them as they go through this week. We pray for, for weather that's not too, um, too difficult for them to deal with. We just pray that they will find strength in all that they do and they will glorify you in all that they do. We pray for Mike Cousino as he leads the 1040 team as a whole this year, this year and every year. And we just thank, thank you for his dedication to the organization, to his dedication to all the work that they do there. And um, Lord, we pray for the doctors, the nurses that are out there. We pray for the construction crews and we pray for those that are, that are given the message of Christ to the kids out there and that they will not only be learning useful things in school that they will use in future life, but they'll be learning through these VBS uh, in Africa the, the importance of a foundation of a solid faith in you and in your son, Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, today we pray for Vivica and Joey as they recover from um, a road accident. You know, we just pray that you will be with them at this particular time. We pray for Kenny Ross as he recovers from, from his injuries, and we just pray for rapid recovery in this case. Um, we pray for Irma. And, um, we just pray that she will find strength through, through you, as always, and she has done so much. We just pray she continues to do so, and that the family will, will seek your face in these times, and that we'll find strength through you that they need um, to be with her and uh, we pray for, for quick and, 
and full recovery for her. We continue to pray for Dan and for Jenny as they go through this difficult stage of life. And uh, we just pray that they will come out of this um, stronger and better and as faithful as ever before. Um, the Hicks, the Hutt, the Duchesne family, as they deal with, with loss over this last couple of weeks, we just pray for them that, uh, that they will come to terms with loss. They will find a way to continue either way, but we just ask for strength in their lives, uh, in their grief. We pray for safety as the team from Hartland come back today uh, in bad weather conditions. So we just pray that all will be well and that the kids will feel revived and refreshed in your word uh, and find new and, and wonderful ways to apply your teachings to their lives uh, after they hear what the message was at camp. We pray all this and more in your name. Amen. All right. So if you've traveled much to England, uh, especially in London, then you might be familiar with the expression, mind the gap. If you've been in the underground in London, if you've been on trains in London, you'll be familiar with the expression, mind the gap. It's kind of one of those things, it's just a warning really that between the station and the train there is a gap that your foot can go down and your leg and I guess depending on your size, the whole body can end up down there and then um, some gaps are much bigger than others when it comes to the train stations, just depends. So it's only fair that we should warn people about the gap and they do and there's this voice. Everybody in London knows this voice but they don't know who it is, they just know it's ringing in their head. It's actually a guy called Peter Lodge. Peter Lodge re recorded the original recording of Mind the Gap that's played at every station around London. And uh, he did it in the 1950s, and it still sounds the same as it did back then. You can tell it was recorded in the 50s when you listen to it, because it just sounds like it, it was. It sounds like it was on an old scratchy record. So that's one of those disc things that you <laughs> need a lot. Sorry, I'm just checking for the young people here. But. But it's become this kind of catchphrase in the UK. It has, you can buy it on t-shirts. It says, mind the gap. You can buy it on all different things, posters on the wall. It's become this sort of iconic phrase of British culture. And it's a little odd when you think about it, but you know, that's exactly what happened. So who am I to argue with it? So why are we talking about the gap? And what is the gap that we need to talk about today from a spiritual nature? Well, the word gap literally means it's a weakness. It's a, something that's a place that's void of something. And a gap can be a dangerous and defenseless position. And to illustrate that, we should look at the World War II. In 1939, in September of 1939, the Germans decided to invade their neighbor Poland. And the Polish army set up along the border of Poland, and they had a pretty strong army at the time. They were, it was a stronghold. The German officers didn't really know what to do. So out of desperation, they made a decision on what to do. And actually, they said later, we just, we didn't have any other option. We didn't know what else to do, so we just did this. It wasn't some major strategy that we came up with, even though Hitler later on made it sound like that. This was the sort of artistry of his German officers that they could create this strategy for defeating the Polish army. But, so what they did was they took all of their panzer tanks, they took all their artillery, and they focused on one area of the Polish lines, and they just pounded it with everything that they had. And eventually, a hole broke in the Polish lines, and they marched through there, all the infantry, all the artillery, all of the tanks went through the single hole in the Polish lines, and then they cut them off from behind, and they flanked them, and they fought them, they, or the supply lines were cut off, and it was devastating to the Polish army. It also became a strategy in military history that was being used over and over again uh, after that. And the, that particular thing was called the Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg in German means lightning or quick, because it happened so fast. Once the hole broke through, they just went straight through there, cut everything off before the Polish army had any time to do anything about it. So it was referred to as the Blitzkrieg, and it changed the face of Poland at that time. But what happened was that the Germans created a gap in the Polish lines. And this gap ended up becoming a massive vulnerability for the Polish army. And that's an extreme version of how a gap can be a danger. It can be a huge threat. And so in the spirit of the Super Bowl Sunday, we're going to throw in some football references. And I've thrown in a few, see if you can spot them all, but some of them I point out, so you'll be able to get those ones. <laughs> so 
Today, we're going to talk, first of all, about football terminology. If you know anything about football terminology, and I don't, so I must admit I had to look this up. But so, a gap in football is a space between offensive and defensive linemen in a line of scrimmage. And these are targets when you're playing football. Why? Because they're a weakness in a line, the gaps in between the players. So if there's a failure to fill or protect the gap, it's said that the line has lost gap integrity. It's no wonder football can be referred to as gridiron wars because there's so many cross-references to the military strategy when it comes to football. But we're going to go back right now 2,500 years. So we're going to go back in history 2,500 years to the year 590 BC. And we're going to look at the people of Israel. The people of Israel at the time in 590 were in a very weak and vulnerable position. There was danger lurking, and the danger that was lurking was in the form of the empire of, the, of Babylon to the north. And they were threatening to come down and destroy Judah and Jerusalem. And there were political leaders at the time that were starting to turn on their own people. And there was also religious leaders that were taking advantage of these cultural weaknesses to change their message and to change the face of religion to suit their own needs. And then there was everybody else who was taking advantage of this situation and the weaknesses in this particular culture, and, the, and crime was rife. Crime was everywhere. Even the weather was creating problems at the time. So things were not going very well for God's people. And that created a huge gap between God and his own people. And God began to look for someone whom he could trust, somebody who would stand strong, somebody who would represent his power, his wisdom, and represent his love at the same time. And so in Ezekiel 22, verse 30, we read, I looked for someone among them who would build up a wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. God found no one to stand in the gap. And the result of that was that Israel got destroyed and thousands of people were taken prisoner to Assyria. Well, not much has changed, really, in two and a half thousand years. There are still world leaders turning on their own people, sometimes in subtle ways, sometimes in much more drastic and obvious ways. There are still religious leaders that are taking advantage of cultural uh, conditions in their countries and changing the message of their religion to suit their own needs and not the needs of their people. And there is crime everywhere. In every neighborhood there's crime, in every city, in every state and all across the country, in every country in the world there is crime and in some of the cities of the world the crime is so bad that it's just unbelievable to see what would happen in these places. People are in danger. People are in pain. There are physically and emotionally weak people and there are many, many vulnerable people. And God is looking for men and women and youth and kids to stand in the gap for him. So where are the gaps in our current culture? Well, gangs and violence and crime of any other kind, those are the obvious gaps. Those are the ones that we look at and go, well, there you go, there's a gap. That's obvious. But then there's the more subtle ones. Things like the forgotten elderly, the poverty cycle where there's no training and there's no skills, neighbors that feud with each other, marriages that come apart, addicts, whether it's drugs, alcohol, pornography, food, or many other types. Parents who have lost hope for their children, human and sex trafficking, abusive family members or spouses, sexual promiscuity, a runaway child, a prisoner emotionally wasting away in their prison cell, racism, attacks on the very sanctity of marriage, prostitution, parents who have lost their children due to unfore unforeseen circumstances, so we should not be lulled into a false sense of security. Just because it seems like none of these things are going on in the four walls of our own home, trust me, some of these things are going on a stone's throw away from your front door. In your own neighborhoods, these things go on, whether you know about it or not. So gaps have appeared in our culture, in our world. And God continues to ask, who will stand in the gap. Who will stand in the gap for me? So what do people that stand in the gap look like? Gap standers. What do they look like? <laughs> Who is God looking for? Well, he's not actually looking for the fearless, the people that embrace the no-fear lifestyle. He already has those people, and that's great. Those are the people that charge in no matter what, and they just do what needs to be done because God has sent them, and they know that they need to work in God's kingdom in that way. 
But God is now looking for people that know their fear, but despite their fear, they're going to move into the gap anyway. Those are the people that God embraces. Those are the people that he wants to get. He wants them to stand in the gap despite the fear that, they've, that they have. The Hebrew word for a type of person who stands in the gap is ish habinayim. Ish or isha is, means man or woman. Habinayim means somebody who places themselves between two camps and offers single combat. So places themselves between two camps in the gap, between two camps, and is willing to fight for the right thing. A champion for the cause. Someone that's passionate about a cause. A person who protects and supports those that need support. Someone who finds the courage to sacrifice everything for the sake of God and push away evil from all those that they love. And as Christians, that's everybody. We should love everybody. Many times we see what needs to be done and what do we do? We spend time explaining away with reasons why we can't do those things. Primarily, there's a tendency to say, well, that's not my gift. There's a lot of people in the Bible that said that. So you could say you were taking an example from the Bible. There's Moses who said, it's not my gift to go and free people from slavery out of Egypt because I don't speak very well, so it can't be me. But God told him he wanted him anyway. Jonah said, it's not my gift. I shouldn't go be... I, I shouldn't." be the one to go speak to the ungodly. I don't have a passion for that. And he ran in the opposite direction, but God pursued him and made him go do it anyway, and it turned out very well. Jeremiah said, it's not my gift. I'm way too young to be of use. And this is a good lesson for the youth. You're never too young to be of use to God. Jeremiah was. God wanted him. And Gideon said, I'm a nobody. What can I do? I don't have any effect on anybody. But he did in the end. And some of you are thinking, yes, but in Romans 12 it says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. If it is um, serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is to give, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And I agree. Paul clearly says we all have different gifts according to the grace given to us by God. And we do tend to serve in a little more joyful way, in a little more efficient way when we're doing the things that the gifts are given to us. But sometimes we don't even realize that we have gifts that God has given us. Sometimes the skills and abilities that we need just need to be brought out. We have to go through an experience in order to bring out a gift that we didn't even know we had. So God is trying to develop us and look for ways to develop us in new ways that we didn't even know that we could be developed in. Sometimes we just need to step up. Why? Because there's nobody else. A mother may not be physically the best person to stand between someone who's trying to kidnap their 12-year-old daughter, but she'll do it. Physically, she'll try. Why? Because she's passionate about her daughter, about her family. She cares, and that qualifies her to stand in the gap. A soldier who is the least trained, the smallest in the troop, are they likely to be the ones to stand back and go, no, I'm not going to do anything? If they see a hole in a wall and there's enemies, enemies coming through the hole in the wall, are they just going to say, I'm not qualified, I'm the smallest, I'm the least trained, I don't want to do that? They step up. Because if they're the only one that see it, they're going to be the only one that's left standing to do it. So that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. When there's no one else to do it, Sometimes there's no choice. We've heard stories, multiple stories, Iraq and Afghanistan in the wars where people that have been trained in support roles end up finding themselves, you know, in the front lines. Suddenly there's a firefight and they, they don't step back and say, well, I'm just a truck driver. I don't, I don't have to fight this war. They do it because there's nobody else there. And they're soldiers. They step up because that's their job. All of this is to say that sometimes willing hearts have to take priority over special gifts. Willing hearts sometimes need to take a priority over special gifts. 
God loves a willing heart. Whatever happens and whatever gap needs to be filled, we need to fill it. Sometimes it's not going to be in our comfort zone. But you know, the people who were standing in the gap between, they're not in their comfort zone at all. They must be, they're probably very uncomfortable, more uncomfortable than we could possibly be. So just think about that. If you think, well, this is not going to be comfortable for me. Well, think about the other people. God will so often honor a willing heart. And more importantly, he will equip you for the task that he wants you to do. So let's go back to the original scripture in Ezekiel we were talking about. So back in history, we get a good example of someone who stepped into the gap. 586 BC, the Babylonians did invade and finally defeated Judah. They destroyed the temple of Jerusalem. They stole a lot of stuff. They took all the gold vessels out of the temple and they force marched thousands of people back to Babylon. Imagine women and children being dragged through hundreds of miles. The physical pain must have been extreme, but not just that, the emotional distress that they must have felt at the time because they've just watched the temple being destroyed in Jerusalem. This is a temple that for hundreds of years the Jewish people had worshipped at, and this is the very presence of God in their midst, and they've seen it destroyed. So emotionally, they must be very distraught as well. 50,000 people were exiled to Babylon from Judah, including Ezekiel. So now we fast forward a little bit, 140 years, and we come across a man called Nehemiah. Now Nehemiah had remained in Persia even though about almost 50 years after the exile, the Jewish people were allowed to go back to Judah, they were allowed to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their lives. But some of them decided to stay. Nehemiah was part of the, the somebody that decided to stay. And he had risen to the job of cupbearer to the king Artaxerxes. And he, and this is a very good job to have. The cupbearer is very much the right-hand man of the king. Somebody who is high up in the court and who's well respected. So the families that decided to stay in Persia even after they were allowed to go back to Judah, many of them now are the ancestors of what's known as the Iraqi Jews now. So Nehemiah, the story of Nehemiah starts with he goes to his brother, whom he sees, who just got back from Judah. And his brother's name was Hanani, and he was in the capital city of Susa, and they came across him, and his brother just got back, and he said, so how's everything going in the homeland? They still call it the homeland because it's just their heritage. So his brother had been to visit, come back, and he said, how's it going? Of course, he expects him just to say, everything's great. Things are swimming along down there. But he did, that's not the report that he got. His brother said, outsiders are harassing the citizens. They're raping the women and stealing from others. And no one seemed to be able to change this. And suddenly this became a huge, heavy burden on Nehemiah. It weighed very heavy on his heart. So he went to prayer. That was the first thing he did. He went to prayer. He wept. He prayed. He fasted for days. The fact that God's people were in so much distress and in so much danger was not acceptable to Nehemiah, even though he wasn't living in that part of the world. He was living in Persia, but these were his people, God's people. So we're going to read a little bit of Nehemiah, starting at verse 4. And the reason I'm reading it in its full thing, this is the prayer of Nehemiah. And I'm reading this because as we read it, we should also be aware that this is kind of like a lesson in how to pray. There's various parts in the Bible that we hear certain prayers and they're structured in such a way where, you know, they're very meaningful. And this is a great example of how to pray to God. So we're going to read the whole thing. But it says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and prayed before God of heaven. And I said, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. So he starts off praising God. That's how to pray. Praise God first because why wouldn't we? You've got to praise God. And then he confesses sins. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave to your servant Moses. So he's asking for forgiveness. This is the structure of prayer. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, he's saying to God, remember. And he's like, well, of course God remembers. 
If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you amongst the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are from the furthest horizon, I will gather them from, here, from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as my dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom, I've, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let, the, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. So he's very humble. It's a very humble prayer. I am your servant. And then he gets to the point, finally. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. So before he even asks for what he wants, he's giving God praise. He is asking forgiveness for his sins because he knows he's a sinner. So Nehemiah needed to talk to the king, but he knew that he needed God's intervention in order to do this. This type of prayer, this sort of deep, meaningful prayer that Nehemiah prayed, isn't just a special prayer for people in the Old Testament. It's not a special kind of prayer for pastors, for ministry leaders, for deacons. This is the type of prayer we should all be praying. Powerful. Because when we pray like this, we get dramatic insights into what it is that God wants us to do. And in this case, God moved the heart of a pagan king. He changed his heart. Nehemiah wasn't one of the generations that was dragged through the desert hundreds of miles in order to get to Babylon. He was the next generation on. He had a cushy job. He was the cupbearer. But this news really distressed him. And he felt like God was calling attention to it because he was the one that needed to stand in the gap. But his brother had commented when he spoke to his brother that no one could do anything about it in Jerusalem. No one could do anything about it in Jerusalem. It's an interesting phrase. There's a lot of people in Jerusalem. Yet Nehemiah is going to be the one to step up and he's not even in Jerusalem. So perhaps the question should be, why was no one willing to do anything in Jerusalem? God was looking for someone to stand in the gap and again, he found no one in Jerusalem. So he was called to fill the gap. And so he prayed. The first thing he did was prayed. He prepared. This was part of his preparation. He needed to put together his game plan, and that was his way of doing. So now we're back in the NFL for a second. 25 seconds between plays. And this is a time when you get to your game plan together. You get in a huddle. You figure out what it is you need. You need the right players. You need the right strategy, because each move is slightly different. Planning is great, but action is critical. So when you go to prayer, this is your time to get in a huddle with God, to talk to your to your coach, to your quarterback. And then he went to the king. And the king granted his request. He didn't just grant his request. He gave him the leave of absence, but he also gave him a lot more. So this was how God moved in the pagan king's heart. He gave him a leave of absence to go and figure this out. And then he also gave him papers so that he could travel from Babylon to Jerusalem without getting harassed by anybody because he'd show them the papers and it would say, this is by order of King Artaxerxes. So everybody's like, okay, because he was a powerful man back then. People were afraid of him. But that wasn't enough. He had the papers, he had the leave of absence. So now he gave him cavalry and he gave him army officers to go with him to protect him. And as if that wasn't enough, he even gave him all the materials to fix the walls in Jerusalem. He said, take all this with you. Talk about God equipping you when you take the right move and step into the right gap. So when the gap exists and God wants us to stand in it, he provides all the tools that we need and then some. But talking to the king wasn't easy. King Artaxerxes, like I said, was the most powerful man in history and he was very, people were very afraid of him. And even though Nehemiah was very much high up in his court and he had the trust of the king, he was still afraid because if you look in chapter 2 verses 4 and 5, it says... The king said to me, what is it you want? So the king said, what do you want, Nehemiah? And then it says, and then I prayed to the God of heaven. So he didn't answer immediately. He still felt this need to pray at that point. He's like, okay, God, I hope this goes the right way. Give me the right words right now. So they go. The king says go. So they go. And they get to Jerusalem. They start rebuilding the wall. You can see in the Bible, all different groups of people get together. Lots of support to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to, to fill the gaps. There's also plenty of opposition. Opposition to building a wall. Don't understand that. <laughs> so, so here we have Nehemiah not only standing in the gap between evil and, the people, and God's people, but also literally filling the gaps in a physical wall. 
I wish I had time to go into all the people that filled the gap in the Bible and Scripture because there's so many of them and the stories are so awesome. It's unbelievable. Like Moses, Noah, Esther, David, Gideon, and people like John the Baptist, all of them filled the gap in spectacular ways. And they're great stories. And these sort of stories make you fall in love with the Word of God over and over again because they're exciting. I mean, Moses stood in the gap between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And the story of freeing God's people from the slavery in Egypt is an amazing story. And Moses stepped up in the most unbelievable ways. He went from being a reluctant kind of gap stander to an authority. And he became God's vessel for the people of Israel. He parted the the waters of the Red Sea with the army of Pharaoh bearing down on them from behind. And the reason the, the Pharaoh's army was bearing down on them was because God sent them. I mean, Pharaoh sent them, but God, it says in Exodus 14, 4, it says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and and they will pursue them. So God created this, this epic chase. They were free. They were gone. But then God changed the heart of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh sent his army after them. He wanted them to cross the seas on dry land. He wanted the people of Israel to see the most incredible power of God so that they'd be much more inclined to follow Moses, much more inclined through Moses to follow God because they would have seen the awesome power of God. So in this dire situation, the Egyptian army is bearing down on them. Moses again stands in the gap. He becomes a conduit for the power of God and he creates a gap in the seas. They walk through it on dry land and then he closes the gap behind them and the Egyptian army is swallowed up. And the people watching were in awe. The Israelites watching were in awe, at least for a little while. I don't know, these stories, whoever says the Bible is boring either hasn't read it or they're just boring themselves. (laughs) So this is a classic example of how God equips us to become what he wants us to become. Not only what we think we should become or the, the pathway that seems the most comfortable for us. God uses, used Moses in the most powerful way to lead his people and to become everything to his people through the power of God as they wandered around the wilderness. Moses even stood in the gap when God wanted to annihilate his people. In Exodus 32 it says, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But then Moses sought the favor of the Lord God and said, Lord, why should you anger, your anger burn against your people when you brought, out of Egypt, you brought them out of Egypt with a great power and your mighty hand? And the amazing thing is, in verse 14 it says, And the Lord relented. Standing in that gap is pretty frightening. You're standing between the Lord God Almighty and the people that he wants to burn. That's a tough gap to stand in, but he does. And he is successful because God relented. So let's think about the gaps in our own lives. What creates gaps in our lives? Sin. Sin creates gaps in our lives because sin separates us from God. It makes us independent of God. It makes us think that we've got our own thing going. We beat of our own drum. We don't need God in our lives and separates us through sin. There's an image that we use as Christians where we say there's a hedge of protection around us, a hedge, a wall of protection around us that is created by the love of God, by our belief that Jesus is the Savior. But sin puts holes in this wall. Sin creates holes in the hedge, and what is a hole or a gap? It's a vulnerability. And once there's a gap in it, everything else can get in. It's kind of like the German army plowing through the Polish lines. Once there's a small gap, it's just enough to get everything coming in. Temptations start coming into our lives. It's like a ship filling with water. Eventually, it's just going to capsize and slip beneath the surface. So there's a danger that we fill ourselves with so much sin and temptation that we just slip down beneath the surface. We get to a point where we throw up our arms and say, I don't know, I've gone this far. What does it matter now? I just keep going. The expression slippery slope didn't come about by accident. It's just a small thing that turns into a bigger thing. And it goes on and on and on. The Daniel plan people we've been talking about is, you know, on Wednesday to say, don't let one day derail you. 
So you have one bad day with food or you don't exercise or you have a bad week with exercise. Don't let that derail you, but get back on track. It doesn't matter. Just put that out of your mind. Like yesterday, I mean, I had 9,800 boxes of cookies in my house. <laughs> I didn't have a good food day yesterday. <laughs> so, but I just get back on track. That's okay. I'm not going to let it derail everything that we've been doing because it's just one day. The same thing with this. Why, why can we get back on track with sin? And we can because Jesus died for us. Jesus himself stood in the gap. He's the one rebuilding the wall or the hedge of protection around us, even though we might have put gaps in it with our sin. He's qualified because of his life and his death here on earth and his ministry. He's the conduit between us and God. In John, he's described as the way, literally the pathway to God. There is no other way except through him. He's a bridge for us to God. And he'll bridge the gap through his crucifixion. He'll take on the sin of the world. He'll cleanse us and enable us to walk on the path of eternal life. Have you ever heard of the man D.L. Moody? D.L. Moody was an evangelist in the 19th century. He was a very successful evangelist in the 19th century. Over the 40 years of his ministry, it's estimated that he, uh, he helped a million people come to know Christ in their lives. Which right now you think, well, you know, Billy Graham reached a lot more than that. And Billy Graham was the modern equivalent of D.L. Moody, even though he's gone now. But a million people back in the 1800s, imagine, there was not mass media back then. The million people that he helped accept Christ into their lives were because he talked to them in revivals. It was one-on-one. -on -one. It wasn't one to a group. It wasn't on TV. It wasn't through radio. It wasn't through anything like that. It was purely through the presence of his presence with other people. And so that's pretty staggering when you think about it. But more than that, he also planted churches. He, planted, he started a Christian school. He launched Christian publishing business. He established a well-known Christian conference center. He inspired literally thousands of ministry leaders and pastors to transform lives and to put together revivals. One story that I like about D.L. Moody is that in his life he decided that he'd pick a hundred of his friends who didn't know Christ. And then over the 40-year period of his ministry he decided that he was going to pray for these hundred people on a very regular basis. Sometimes daily he'd revolve, you know, about who he was going to pray for on any given day, but he prayed for them all on a regular basis. And by the time he died at the age of 62, 96 of these people had given their life to Christ. 96%. It's a pretty good average. But it didn't finish there because the last four went to his funeral and before the funeral was finished, they'd given their life to Christ as well. So he completed the hundred friends that he was determined to show Christ to in his life. Because Moody was a man that knew the power of prayer. And I'm telling you this because prayer is a huge part of what we can do to stand in the gap. We saw Nehemiah. The first thing that Nehemiah did, he went to prayer as soon as he saw the gap. Others, many others in the Bible go to prayer in the same scenario. It's a very important step in the process. There's a prayer right at the end of what's called Jesus' farewell discourse. And this is in John between the chapters of 13 and 17. So Jesus' farewell discourse towards the end uh, of his ministry uh, as recorded by John and this is when Jesus started to take steps towards filling the gap, towards his crucifixion. So we're looking at Jesus praying. And it's interesting because Jesus' actual words of prayer are not recorded very often in the Bible. We hear that he prayed alone, he prayed at night, he prayed by himself, he prayed for others, he prayed for children that came to him, he prayed outside in nature, he prayed for his persecutors. But we don't often hear about what it is physically that he prayed Whereas here it's written out in quite some detail. The Lord's Prayer we hear about, but that's very much an instructional prayer for his disciples. But this is a prayer that's recorded in detail, and it has three parts to it. The first, time, the first part of it is that he prays for himself. The second is that he prays for his disciples. And then later on in the prayer, he, does, he prays for all of the believers. This is what you could call an intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is just a way that Jesus was interceding in the lives of others, in the lives of his disciples, lifting them up so that God could hear what he has to say. Another word for interceding would be to stand in the gap, to be the go-between, a connector 
Kind of like the Wi-Fi router. Everything goes to the source. So we should look at what it means to intercede for others. And what can we learn about how Jesus prays and how our role in life is as an intercess- as intercessory for others. We have intercessions in church. You might not know that's what it's called, but every time every do, we do announcements, at the end of it we have prayer requests. We're lifting people up to God. We're asking God, we're pleading with God to look at this situation and help. We're interceding on behalf of others. That's what it is. Romans 8 says we hear that if God is for us, who can be against us? This is why we do it. He's our biggest fan. The passage goes on to say that God doesn't condemn us. He's the one who intercedes for us through Jesus Christ. Jesus stands at the foot of, the, uh, at the foot of God and, on our behalf and he intercedes for us. Hebrews 7 talks about what it needs, means to be a priest. And Jesus is described as the high priest. And it says he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them, to stand in the gap for them. And that's pretty amazing. If you think about it, it's like always having somebody who's beating your drum and saying how amazing you are and defending you when you need it and being there because when you make a mistake, and we all make mistakes, he'll be there standing up for you if you ask forgiveness. And why is this important? Because Paul tells us to be like Jesus. Paul tells us that we should mirror the life of Jesus. We should get as close as possible to the characteristics that Jesus had in his life. And in turn... Because Jesus stood in the gap for us, we should stand in the gap for others. And we can always, always find a gap to stand in. We just have to look carefully enough. And sometimes it might just be saying a prayer for someone, interceding on their behalf. And I don't just mean, a, oh, I'll pray for you and then a quick prayer in the car. Pray deeply for people. Feel it. Like Nehemiah, that prayer, he felt it, he wept, he fasted. And I'm not saying you should necessarily do that, but just feel it when you pray and really understand what it is you're asking God to do. It might also just be a physical need. It might be a meal, it might be that someone needs a ride somewhere. They might just need an ear to talk to. They might need someone just to listen to them and understand what they're going through. It could just be a Bible verse that you could provide to someone that could make a difference in their life, provide hope. It could be an open door when all they come across is closed doors. Sometimes people who are in need of hope need one thing, to hear that there is hope through Christ. Sometimes standing in the gap for others means being physically present while others just step back. Others step back because they say to themselves, I'm not qualified, I'm not equipped, I'm not the one for this job. But here's the good news. Jesus equips us all. And in the vein of evangelism that we're focusing on this year and in the thrust of the need to to spread the gospel of Christ, then we need to stand in the gap. And we are equipped with the most versatile tool we could ever have, and that is the Word of God. So whatever the gap is, wherever it is, this will fill it. It provides that hedge, that wall of protection around us because Christ is the bridge He's the way. With Christ, there's no gap between us and God. And if we choose to keep it to ourselves, then we really need to examine our own hearts. Why wouldn't we spread the news of joy to other people that we know? Why would we keep it to ourselves? That's the definition of being selfish. We have this amazing thing in our life, the joy of Christ, and yet we keep it to ourselves and we don't tell other people about it. Why not? What do we have to lose? They don't have to listen, but we should at least try. So standing in the gap looks different in many ways. It could be prayer. It could be traveling to Africa. It could be going to the rescue mission. It could be going into the neighborhoods of South Fresno and working with gangs. It could be going to your next door neighbor and praying for them, providing a, a message of hope. Look for the gaps and fill them. God is still looking for someone to stand in the gap. Let's pray. Lord God, we just give thanks for the story of Nehemiah. We give thanks for the story of Moses and all the other people in the Bible. Lord, we just can take so much hope. We can take so much in lessons from these people. 
And even though this is thousands of years ago, we still stand in the same situation now. There are gaps all around us, and Lord, give us the wisdom and the eyes to see these gaps, to provide what is needed in these gaps, and not to shy away and say, this is not my job, this is not my gift. We know that you'll provide us with the gifts that we need when we're the only ones that will stand up and fill that gap. Lord, help us to use your holy word as a weapon so that we can fill these gaps when we need to and provide hope. Because we don't want to keep that to ourselves. Why would we? So Lord, we thank you for all that you give us, all the resources that you provide us. And we pray that we have the wisdom to use them the way you want us to. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Have a great Super Bowl slash cookie Sunday. I'll see you next week.